Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of uh, Minority Reports Podcast and Digital Series. I am your host, Mona Sheik. You guys, uh, I know uh, 8 p.m. is late, so thank you so much for sticking around and uh, tuning in. I appreciate it very, very much. I know the Biden debate, uh, the Biden, uh, so rather, town hall is uh, happening, and I'm, I'm actually very happy that uh, Biden chose to do his town hall in Pennsylvania. And of course, uh, Trump is in South Florida. And, you know, those are just two very different town hall meetings. Uh, One is an absolute disaster, which we know which one it is. Uh, It's Trumpies. And uh, Biden's is just so much more calmer, uh, composed, presidential, really presidential, you know. Um, I know we're not going to get too political right now because uh, I have a guest tuning in today. All the way from Dubai, you guys. Yes, I, uh, I'm i expanding my horizons as far as my international guests go. Uh, so I am waiting for him to tune in shortly, which he would be, uh, which I'm very excited about. Uh, this person is uh, really a trailblazer. Um, this person's a you know Canadian um, hip-hop musician uh, and uh, really built out their career in songwriting and uh, had the opportunity to work with some really big people early on in their career. And now are moving on to have moved on to my goodness, come up founder and CEO of a publishing company, um, music publishing company in Dubai. And um, he's going to be tuning in shortly. Uh, but I wanted to actually ask you guys. Uh, let's see here. James said, "Good evening, everybody. Hello, James. How are you?" Uh, and then Tim said, "Hey, James." Uh, and uh, Tim said, "Hey, Mona, I can't make the show. I have to go to work in four hours. Damn it, Tim." No, don't go to work. Stay. Don't go. Um, you guys, I do have a really cool announcement to make today. Um, I uh, just got offered yesterday to be a host of a fabulous show at the Comedy Store, which will be uh, streaming live starting October 30th, which is an honor. And it's called, it's called Shit Gets Real. Yeah. And I'm going to be the host of the show. So I'm very excited. Of course, the Comedy Store is my uh, home comedy club in uh, Los Angeles, and I'm very, very excited to be a part of it and getting offered the show, which is a big deal for any comic to be offered to host a show at the Comedy Store. Anyways, our guest has joined us, um, and without further ado, just a quick intro on our very fantastic guest. Uh, like I mentioned, he is better known by his stage name, Spec. He's a Canadian hip hop musician. He is best known for his singles, Smell the Coffee, and I'm a Hippie. Listen, anything to do with coffee, I'm about that life. I'm a caffeine addict. Uh, so, without further ado, uh, please welcome Hussein Speck Yusuf. Hussein, how are you, my friend? I'm good. How's it going? Uh, I can't, I can't. Can you hear me? No, I can hear you. Uh, you can hear me? Can your, your volume is very low. I don't know why. Any better? Oh, so much better. Oh, so much better. Yeah. But there's an echo. Okay. There is an echo. Um, hmm. Maybe it's my mic. Uh, give me a quick second. Yeah. Let me. Uh, let me. Oh, it's stop so echoing. for a second. Can you hear it? Yeah. I can hear you fine, but if are you still hearing I an think echo? The echo? Yeah, yeah. The echo went away. I don't know what. Okay. Yeah. How are okay. you, my friend? I, I know it's, uh, it's 7 a.m. in Dubai, so thank you for waking up super early to do that. <laughs> That's all good. That's all good. How are I'm you? Good. I'm, I'm good. I am uh, very excited to have you on as a guest, and uh, we have people who are tuned in and watching this because I try to bring in as many international guests as I can. And um, I was watching, uh, well, watching your video uh, about Smell the Coffee and I'm a hippie, and um, you know, you started off uh, as a, you, you started off as a hip Canadian hip hop musician, dude. First of all, what you, you, your background is Sri Lankan, right, Spec? Yeah, yeah. I um, like my parents were born in Sri Lanka, uh, but they were sort of first generation immigrants. All of their, uh, I suppose, by coincidence, both of my parents were their young, you know, the sort of on the younger end of their siblings. All of their older siblings and their parents were born in India pre-partition. 
But in the 40s and 50s, when they moved to Sri Lanka, um, you know, they were Muslim Indians who uh, I guess were, you know, had a choice of going to Pakistan or staying in India. But uh, both my grandfathers were in the textile industry. And at that time, the real centers in Asia for textile were Madagascar and Sri Lanka. And so they just sort of coincidentally moved, both moved to Sri Lanka at the same time, and neither of them spoke uh, Sinhalese. So uh, so they, my two grandfathers became friends, and then that's how my parents met. Wow. So, yeah. so now, do you speak Sinhalese? I don't. I don't. I mean, I was born in Canada, and I was raised in Canada, so... Um, and Sinhalese wasn't really, uh, you know, sort of a language spoken by, you know, sort of the native that language of the family. Yeah. So, um, so no, I don't speak it. Uh, I've certainly been to Sri Lanka a bunch of times. I go, I go as often as I can. I love it out there. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah, no, I don't speak Sinhalese. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a French Canadian at heart, I guess. So, so you, you get English and French from me, but not much else. English and French, yeah, uh, that's a that's a bit. My brother was getting uh, was uh, at a at a training from his job in Quebec, and he was like, "Dude, they are so strict about speaking French there. They are all about that French life." I know it's sort of gotten dark there a little bit in recent years. You know, when I was there, um, we certainly felt the sort of rub of. Uh, the language issue in, 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 you know, Montreal was always sort of the hotbed of the debate around the French language in Canada. Um, and as I got older into my teens, there were a lot of political debates. Um, you know, they had a referendum uh, when I was living there when I was a teenager where they wanted to separate from Canada to try and preserve the French language. So it's always been a very, uh, you know, sort of hot topic and it's become even more after I, I, I mean, I left Canada a long time ago, uh, yeah. but in the years since I've left, they've since had like language police introduced and, you know, it's become a lot more hardcore about uh, um, the preservation of the French language. So yes, I lived through all of that. And I, you know, the funny thing is, is that I never really, I'm terrible with languages really, you know, I mean, I, I love the English language. That's why I got into hip hop, you know, I love the sort of manipulation of the English language is always a sort of a favorite subject in school. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, I've been generally terrible at languages, but I, so I, they taught me French in school, but I never really learned. But one of my neighbors was a French kid and he didn't speak English. And so that's how I learned French. So I, so I tell people all the time, I speak French, uh, like George Bush speaks English, you know, it's sort of, I've, I've, I've got the equivalent of a Texan drawl uh, except in uh, Quebecois French, you know, like, uh, which I is quite know. funny for, for a brown guy to, to, to have, to, to watch a brown guy speaking French like that. I, I mean, look, I, I like uh, to see uh, brown guys speak all kinds of languages. I'm about that. <laughs> um, uh, my thing is that, uh, it, do you have the uh, word equal to in French of strategery? You remember strategery during the British <laughs> era? Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, no, I don't. I, you know, I'm so rusty with my French. But yes, I mean, the thing the thing about Quebecois French is that it's sort of like it's like Spanglish. You know, it's like it's a mix when you don't know what how to fill in a word. You just sort of say it in English with a French accent. And it sort of uh, it sort of works uh, in Montreal. Got it. That way. <laughs> Got it. So you're so you start off as a musician at 14. I mean, which is a, you know, the cool thing, like, how are your. Um, this is going to be very dissy of me to ask you this. How were your parents about like being like, oh, you're going to become a musician at like 14? Like what's going on here? You're not going to go. I know that you briefly went to college and you pursued law, but at 14, like that's a big deal. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, I definitely didn't pursue law. Uh, although I now think I, you know, I, you know, I, I sort of now fancy the idea of doing it, you know, uh, but no, I never per pursued law. I went to college for about two months and I dropped out and I joined a rap group. Uh, and, you know, so when I, when I was 14, we um, I went to a school in the east end of Montreal, which was which is the sort of little Italy of Montreal. So I was like the only brown kid in a school of it was me one and one other kid and a black kid. And we were the only 
uh, kids of color in a school of about 2000 students, you know? Wow. So, uh, so our teachers were Italian, the principal, the vice president, everybody was Italian. It was sort of like growing up in a Scorsese movie, you know, it really felt like Brooklyn, you know, in a Scorsese movie. Um, and so one of the kids in school sort of said to me one day, he, he had sort of discovered hip hop. It was the late eighties and he walked into class with headphones and he was like blasting um, what I now know is like De La Soul, Say No Go, which came out around 89. And it was just, I used to, I, I'd hear these horns, you know, like, and you could hear it through sort of the headphones in class. And I was like, what is that? Like who comes in listening to sound, like these loud jazz horns, you know? And, um, and I said, oh, what are you listening to, you know? And he was like the most popular kid in school. He was sort of, he was an Irish, uh, Irish by background. And so you just put the headphones on my head and I heard it for the first time. And it was like, I was mind blown away. You know, I was like, wow, what is this? You know? And he had a little rap group in school. And so he was just like, yo, you're like the only brown guy in school. Like, you got to have soul. Like, you know, why don't you join my rap group, you know? And uh, it was as simple and stupid as that. And, um, you know, and so then I went home that day and I wrote my first rap and I came back the next day to school and I showed it to him. And he was just like, you didn't write that, you know? And I was like, no, I did, you know? And he was just like, all right, your homework for today is to go home and write a rap about people who... Uh, uh, pretend to write raps that they, did, they didn't really write, right? Yeah. And so I went home that day and I did that. And I came in the next day and I performed it for him. And then he sort of was like, oh, you should join my group. And so, you know, I joined his group and we would meet up every day after school and we'd freestyle in the park. And I, through him, I really learned, uh, I went down the deep rabbit hole of, old school hip hop, you know, the, I got into the old Rakim stuff. And, um, uh, he really gave me an education in early hip hop. And, and, you know, at that time it was really just the beginnings of what they call the golden era of hip hop, where the most, some of the most interesting and innovative and creative records were starting to come out. And so we lived through that period. And from about 14 to 17, I was sort of in this group with him about a year after we started the group. Uh, this group called the Dream Warriors were the biggest hip hop group in Canada. And, um, you know, at that time, having rap groups coming out of Canada was a very super, it was the first time that that was happening, you know? And uh, so we went to this record store and um, they had an autograph. So we skipped school, went to the record store and, um, you know, uh, there were like a thousand kids in there and waiting to queue up to, to, to get an autograph. And I had this sort of old school magazine of the first interview the band had done, you know, sort of on paper and stuff. And I got to the front of the line and I said to them, you know, like they, they looked at me because everybody else had just bought a CD about the shop and asked them the autograph. I was the only one who had some sort of, you know, some sort of remnant of their beginnings of their career. And so uh, they were like, yo, why don't you come down to the show? And I was like, well, you know, I'm 14 and the, it's being done at a club, it's 18 and over where there's booze, so they won't let us in. And so they said, well, why don't you show up to soundcheck and we'll sneak you in, you know? And I had never been to a concert before in my life. So, you know, I got together with my homies and I begged my parents to go to this concert and I went and we ended up hanging out with them, you know, and we spent, we got there about five, six o'clock. They were literally just standing outside of the club having a chat. And we spent two hours with them just, you know, talking about the music scene in Montreal and about our high school rap group and the rest of it. And, uh, you know, at the end of the process, they, they said, you know, you know, oh, you freestyle, you know, like, why don't you freestyle for me? You know, and so we start rapping for them. And then they were like, you know, we, we want to produce like new groups out of Canada. You know, if you ever come to Toronto, you know, this is our phone number. Give us a call. We'll, we'll produce your demos. Wow. And really from about the age of about 14, 15 to about 17, I would, I would, I would just dip out to Toronto every chance that I got. My parents half the time didn't know where I was. Um, and so, yes, it was a point of contention. Uh, but, um, but, 
I think eventually they got to the point where they realized that this was something that I was really sort of serious about. And it all came to a head one day when I, uh, when I snuck out of, when, when I snuck out of the crib uh, and stayed out all night and then showed up at eight in the morning with my parents assuming that I was never coming back. And so we had a big sort of row in the house that morning um, but, but at the end of the process, they sort of understood how important it was to me. And, um, and, you know, my dad sort of encouraged me, you know, I showed him a letter that I had written and he had sort of encouraged me to, you know, he was like, wow, this is really well written, you know, you should write more, you know? And I was like, well, that's kind of what music is. That's what rap music is to me, you know? And that was sort of a turning point. And from that point onwards, they really just supported anything I did, even though uh, I think in their heart of hearts, they were really worried about it, you know, because at that time, hip hop was, uh, was really, uh, you know, it, it hadn't commercialized, you know, I mean, so like hip hop clubs were 99.9% in like uh, super hood areas of the city. You know, people were getting shot and stabbed at every hip hop show. Um, and I was always the only brown guy in the, in, in the spot, you know. Right. Um, it, the hip hop community in Montreal at that time was Haitian and the Haitian community was pretty rough, you know. Mm -hmm. And so um, so they worried a great deal about that. But, um, you know, to their credit, they sort of, you know, figured that I'd figure it, figure it out. And so when I was 17... And I dropped out of college. They were just like, okay, you know, I mean, I guess you're going to do your thing. And I, I left, you know, and I moved to Toronto on my own. I had no job. I had no income. I had no nothing, you know, I just left, you know. Um, and um, I ended up moving in with some of the guys in the Dream Warriors, and they were recording their second album at the time. Yeah. And they asked me to record a few songs, and two songs became three. And then they said, do you want to join the group? Yeah. And so I ended up joining the first group I ever went to go see live, you know, and then overnight we were touring around, you know, I think right after our, we finished the record, we went to the UK, but by then the band was big in the UK and uh, we started touring Europe and I, you know, sort of lived the dream for the next uh, four years. We did a few albums together and when the band broke up, I moved to, I moved to London to, to try it solo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things you said about when you moved out, was that, was that like, were your parents were like, what are you going to do? Like, here's a, here's a, here's 2000 Canadian uh, dollars. Uh, here you go. Uh, let us, uh, let us <laughs> no, nothing. I mean, there was, I, you know, um, I don't think, I don't remember asking them for anything. I think I just left. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, they would hear from me every once in a while. And, uh, sorry, was it, um, was it, you know, they were supportive, but they had no idea what the hell I was doing. Was it like, was it like you getting into an argument or a fight with them one night and being like, I'm out? No, it was, I mean, th that argument night happened when I was like, when I, you know, I, 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 I dipped out and I went out to like a party. <laughs> And uh, I wanted to go to this party and I would leave a note for my dad on the, my dad worked night shift at the time. Right. So I would leave like, like a note for my dad and I'd say, you know, I want to go to this party. Is this okay? And in the morning he'd leave me a note saying yes or no, or be oh, back wow. by midnight or whatever it was. Right. Wow. And so I left him a note and for whatever reason he, he, he said no. And so uh, at about seven or eight o'clock, I just sort of stuffed my bed uh, as we do and we were, we lived in a second floor apartment and so i opened the window and i jumped out the window uh, onto the on, onto the balcony and then i i climbed down this the 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 stairwell and i left you know and i went out and i uh partied like hell with my homies and by about seven or eight o'clock i came back and i was uh yeah i was uh demonstrably inebriated at 14. Um, and, uh, you know, they were worried, you know, my mom was really upset, um, you know, by the time I, so that I come back uh, about seven or eight in the morning and there's a sign on the back of the door, like, don't try jumping back into your window from the balcony, like the back door is open. Right. Wow. And, 
And so, and so I walk back in the door and, um, and my mom's crying and stuff and upset. And I came in and I had this chat with my dad and then that sort of turned into an argument. But like I said, by the end of it, we, um, you know, we sort of came to an understanding, you know, and, uh, and from that day forward, it was just, it was like, uh, you know, they were like super supportive, you know, even if they didn't necessarily believe in it, you know, um, which, you know, I, I, you know, I don't know a lot of friends who have that, you know, so, right. um, so they, 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 they really got it. I mean, they certainly didn't think that I was going to become a, a famous rapper in Canada or the UK or whatever it is, and then become a movie publisher and be a entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't know that, that that was my future. I certainly thought that my life was going to be one of an artist for the rest of my life. And I was quite, I was quite happy with that, you know? Right. Um, but, uh, I don't know. I guess they, they, they sort of saw the conviction that I had and they supported me, you know? And then of course, once it was soon after I joined the dream warriors. And of course we were putting out videos and the equivalent of MTV in Canada was much music uh, at that time. And, you know, they supported us a lot. So the video would be on TV all the time in Canada. We had a comic book, you know, we like, it, it sort of blew up in Canada and then they would hear me on the radio or see me on TV all the time. And so they were like the proudest parents ever, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, they didn't understand what the hell I was doing, but they knew that I was doing what I wanted. So uh, they supported it. Do you feel like with a lot of like immigrant parents, because you got your first generation and they're immigrants, um, there's always this sense of because uh, being an artist is such a kind of far-fetched, idea right it's like this dream like they they, they want to live in certainty what is certainty uh going to medical school going becoming an engineer uh becoming yeah. a lawyer those are those are certainties but i it sounds like your parents were like if we keep uh pushing back against on him he's just gonna keep doing and probably keep doing more even more fucked up things and we don't <laughs> want to get into more fucked up things so let's just be part of this journey, wherever he's going, at least we get to keep an eye on him. Yeah. So like there, there's a bit of like, my parents were hippies growing up in the sixties. And I, I, I think that there's something to be said about the fact that they were immigrant children, first generation immigrant children as well, although it was Sri Lanka. And if you look at sort of the context of Asia, certainly at that time uh, in Sri Lanka in the seventies, it wasn't uncommon for, um, an 18 year old kid boy to show up to pick up a girl at how at the house and take her out on a date and before while she's getting ready have a drink with her dad you know in Sri Lankan culture that wasn't that that could happen you know that was normal even right? in the family spec uh less so in the Muslim families but actually you know the I mean, I, I, I think some people might debate this, but, you know, in Sri Lanka, um, nowadays you'll have communities that are, you know, sort of quite conservative, even in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but at that time, um, everybody's sort of mixed up, you know. I mean, the Muslim community in Sri Lanka, I think, is about, I think it's about, 30 or 40 percent of the population you know so it's, it's yeah. a significant part of the population but but the majority of the population is buddhist and so you know culturally there's it's it, it almost feels like the west indies in a lot of ways in that the liberalism of, of it you know yeah. um you know you you definitely weren't getting that sort of um liberal uh sort of society in india or pakistan at the time you know sure. So, um, and, 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 and then when you add on to that fact that my grandparents were Indian immigrants, so my grandparents were sort of like, um, what Asian parents would be in Canada, you know, like, cause they were Indian and they had the Indian culture, which was a lot more conservative and they wanted to sort of maintain that within the household, even though outside the household, it was super Western. You know, right. uh, girls wore mini mini skirts even back then. You know, in Sri Lanka, where that might not have been the case in Pakistan or India, yeah. and so Sri Lanka has always been this sort of liberal outpost. You know, in the middle of Asia. You know, mm -hmm. um, 
for whatever reason. I don't know why it is. I, you know, one, one could argue that maybe it's because of the, the, the majority of the country is Buddhist, but there's definitely a live and let live sort of attitude in Sri Lanka. You know? um, Are the Muslims yeah, so, too? I mean, is that kind of, I would think, look, I'm Pakistani and I was born and raised in Pakistan until I was 15. And uh, even to this day, I mean, even in, uh, you know, I would say more on the upper echelon, like the more wealthier families, they get to drink and wear mini skirts and party and do whatever the hell they want. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, yeah. there's that double standard. But if you're a middle class or if you're poor, I mean, you're definitely very conservative. There, there are no mini skirts to be found. Spec. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> no, definitely. I mean, there, there's another okay. added element to this, which is actually yeah. a little bit more personal, which is my, my father's older brother was a motorcycle racer in Asia. Um, um, it was my uncle Farouk, but you know, when he, he was quite a rebel himself. So my, my father's family were, um, you know, sort of well to do my father, my grandfather, my father's side was sort of a successful entrepreneur, textile op- entrepreneur in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, very wealthy, you know, friends with, you know, politicians, that sort of thing. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, his son, which is my father's elder brother, um, was a rebel, you know, and he ran away from home when he was 14. And he stowed away on a British Navy ship that was docked in Sri Lanka at the time. And he disappeared, you know, for the next four years. And in that time, he traveled around the world. He got tatted up, uh, you know, sort of good looking guy, ended up in London. Okay. Uh, the legend has it that he got in a bar fight in London at 17, broke a bottle over somebody's head and killed them accidentally. And so he was arrested and uh, they didn't know what to do with him, you know, because he was an illegal immigrant in the country. So they deported him back to Sri Lanka. Uh, so he shows up now uh, after missing for four years um, you know, back at his parents' place and they, and he's fully tatted up and the whole thing. And his father is like a successful business guy. People weren't getting tatted, like brown guys weren't getting tatted up unless they were serious criminals at that time. You know I mean? He had down to his fingers, clubs, spades, diamonds, hearts, you know, his, his childhood sweetheart when he was 14, her name was Silverine. He had her name tattooed across his chest. Wow. You know, he was like, you know, he was a badass, you know? Yeah. And uh, and then he immediately stole his father's car and turned it into a stock car and then entered it into what they call a clubman class race, which is a qualifying race if you want to become a racer. And he won the race. Yeah. Uh, but he was arrested at the finish line because his father had called and said, somebody stole my car and checked the racetrack. Right. Yeah. And so. Uh, so my dad said to him, my dad had just gone to had gone to school in Pakistan for a couple of years. So my dad came back and said to him, you know, the name Khan is like really popular in Pakistan, but it was an unknown name at that time in Sri Lanka. Okay. And he said, you know, why don't we come up with a name for you so dad doesn't know it's you that's racing? And so his his name was Farouk, so his, his nickname in school was Freaky. So they came up with this name Freaky Khan. And he ended up racing under that assumed name. And then he became sort of more and more famous. And, of course, when you're racing, you've got a helmet on. So nobody knows, nobody knows what you look like, right? At, at that time, it was pre, you know, uh, television being as ubiquitous as, as it is. So for the first few years, his father didn't know that he was this guy, Freaky Khan, that was winning all these races that was sort of Sri Lankan's champion racer, you know, until eventually somebody told him, that's your son, Right. And he got confronted by his father, you know, and, and, and then his father supported him, right? And he ended up racing as part of the Sri Lankan team, and they raced across Asia, Singapore, and so on. And they raced in India uh, at the Grand Prix, and he won the Grand Prix um, two years in a row. Uh, and both years, he won all four events. So he would enter a race on a 250cc bike and then win the 250 race, the 350 the unlimited thousand cc up uh, and up and the uh, and the grand prix itself and so he sort of had this legendary status as the daredevil racer of the track and uh and and he lived fast and died young he died when he was 33 i was about six years old at the time oh. he was a heavy drinker he uh you know i mean the guy's life was insane you know um so when I was a kid, so he died. I was in Sri Lanka at the time when he died. And so it had a big impact on me. 
And, um, and so when I was sort of rebelling against my parents, I was sort of identifying with him, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I told them that, you know, like, like, you know, nobody really gets me in this family, you know, just like my uncle. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that maybe that was sort of a bridging thing that brought them to just sort of, you know, pull the steam down and then sort of try and engage with me before I went off and did something crazy. You sure. know? Sure. Um, and, and, and that was, I think a big part of where they, they, they just learned to accept it, you know, and figured, okay, well, we don't get what he's doing at all, but, uh, but, but we got to let him do it, you know? Right. Now, Speck, you have two kids. Do you have, te- are they teenagers yet? Uh, not yet, but they're getting there. They're 10 and 12. 10 and 12. Okay. And are you seeing some of yourself in either one of them? You have a boy and a girl, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I see myself uh, a lot in both of them. You know, my son is a lot like me in that he's sort of, um, he's quite chill. Um, and most people that meet him say, oh, this guy's like a carbon copy of you. Uh, my daughter uh, definitely has the sort of freaky con in her, you know, and uh, um, she's, you know, sort of wildly creative and uh, um, uh, a bit of a hothead. Okay. I, you know, I, I feel like some of that stuff is so uh, genetic, like it's so ingrained. You're just like, you just like pre-designed to be a certain way because yeah. uh, it's funny because I am a replica of my mom. If you put me and my mom next to each other, we look like twins, but my, my personality is nothing like my mother. It is right. a replica of my dad, like, you know, out there fucking fast and hard, rebelling, <laughs> doing what the fuck we want. Um, uh, just saying whatever, you know, just uh, very, very. How are they? How are they with you becoming, you know, getting into comedy and sort of going that direction? That would have been a very weird one, I would I'd imagine, at the time. Man, I feel like maybe I could should have been born in Sri Lanka. Now I'm listening to you. <laughs> <laughs> you could wear mini skirts back in like the 80s and 90s. This is amazing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, it wasn't like that. At all. I was never set out to become a stand up comic. I, uh, wanted to become a, a stage actor that's what i really wanted and um yeah my family was not having it spec i'm uh, mm. the youngest and the only girl in the family i have four older brothers uh so i in essence i grew up on a military camp if you just really think about it because right. you know it's like you grew up in a fucking fort uh protected right. by two parents and four older brothers what the hell you, 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 you mm. what the hell you think you're going but i always found a way to sneak out and do whatever the hell I needed to do. Uh, and yeah. I didn't give a shit about the repercussions. But yeah, no, I, I was never really, I, I never really kind of planned out to become a stand-up comic. I just kind of fell into stand-up comedy. But when the whole, when I came out of my artist closet to my family, my I, I was giving a, given an ultimatum because my I live with my brothers here. My parents always lived in Pakistan and they gave me an ultimatum. They said either you're going to go to college and become a physical therapist or we're going to send you back to Pakistan and parent, our parents are going to marry you off. So take your pick. Right. And I was like, neither. I love you. But fuck off. Um, yeah. and I, uh, I packed up my shit and I left, man. I had a, a giant, ginormous fight one night and I was like, I'm out. I just, I, I just can't be a part of this. You know, yeah. I can't like you like crush my dreams. And I feel like, you know, it's like, it's, I, I, I wish, I wish that my parents did what your parents did with you. Right. Yeah. I mean, when you talk about it, like when you talk about the, uh, you know, the, the Brown parents thing and, you know, the Daisy parents and, and how difficult it is to sort of get them to get their head around the art, the arts, you know, for, for us, you know, Um, I feel like I've got a unique perspective on it because um, when I was like, I grew up in a very non, I didn't grow up around brown people. You know, I grew up in French Montreal and then I moved to the little Italy of, so, so I never really had a reference point for the conservatism that I now know is sort of part of the community. You know, I always just, I was always different and I I had no reference point. Right. Um, And then I moved to Toronto uh, when I was 17 and that was the first time where I was surrounded by like loads of 
Desis, you know, and uh, and the Caribbean community as well. I moved in with, a, you know, three of the guys in the Dream Warriors are Jamaican. So then I moved in with them. So I was sort of West Indian <laughs> surrogate for a while. Right. And um, and then I moved in with my buddy Chin, who's uh, uh, who who was in a band as well. And he, he, it was the same thing. He was an Indian kid bass player. Um, he's gone on to do amazing things. He's produced Eminem and uh, 50 Cent and all kinds of people. Uh, but when he started, he was started basically in a soul funk band in Canada called Bases Bass. And we ended up moving together, moving in together. And then we were the only two brown guys in Canada who had record deals. And wow. so, um, so, so then uh, all of a sudden, the Asian community in Canada really embraced us, you know. So then suddenly at Dream Warrior shows, there'd be loads of brown kids at the concerts because they all saw one of their own on stage for the first time, you know. Right. Um, and then when I moved to London, I worked at Nits and Sony and I was part of the whole Asian underground scene over there, which was sort of drum and bass and hip hop mixed with Indian music. And so, and then I moved to the Middle East, you know, and so everywhere I've gone, I've sort of started, I've, I feel like I've walked into the birth pangs of brown kids starting to discover the arts. And I've always been the first one, you know what I mean? I was the, I was the first one to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. To a lot of these kids. Yeah. And, um, and, and so as a result, I've, you know, I'm now 45. So now, you know, I have the, you know, now I'm a, now I'm an executive, you know what I mean? Because I've lived that life. Now I'm meeting 20 year old kids who are doing what I was doing back then. And they think that they're being, you know what I mean? But it's a little bit easier for them, you know, because now there's a few other people That's out right. there and they've got somebody to look at. Now there's Hassan and Anik Khan and yourself and myself. And there's just, it's different, you know. Now you, in Toronto, you turn on the TV, the news reporter is, is an Indian guy or Pakistani or Sri Lankan or whatever it is. And that wasn't what I saw when I grew up. I just saw white people, you know. Um, and... Um, and now, uh, now that I see, like, I'm, you know, at the moment, so I just signed uh, an Indian rapper artist named uh, Divine, you know, who's... I love him. Yeah, you know, he's dro just dropping a new single this morning. You have to watch this video. Oh, my it's God, congrats. I, I cannot, yeah, please. Uh, is it Mirchi? Yes, yeah, it's so dope. The video is dropping in an hour or something, you know, so, um, but, yeah, it's such a banger, and... He's so dope. But, you know, I started going to India a lot over the past five years. And, you know, 10 years ago when you go to India, you talk to them about hip hop and the music scene was intrinsically linked to the Bollywood scene. And the only way that music would be popular was if it was propelled through some sort of Bollywood film machine, you know. Um, suddenly there's a kid like Divine who grows up literally in the slums, you know, in an industry that is completely manufactured typically, you know, and he comes out of the slums and he captures the imagination of the country because he becomes a big famous rapper and he's talking some real shit about what's going on in the streets of the slums, which nobody has ever, that perspective has never been sort of brought to the mainstream, you know? Um, and when I, last year I was there when he, uh, did the album launch for his, uh, his record Koinor. And, you know, it was amazing. You know, it's like they, they, in, I think three or four days just before the, the, the album launch, they just decided to put on a show and like six, 7,000 kids just showed up to this, you know, sort of airfield where they decided to put on this free concert, you know, amazing. and, uh, or actually I'm not sure if it was free, but it was a concert. And, um, and, you know, um, now there's a really vibrant hip hop scene that is that really reminds me of Toronto in the '90s. You know, when people talk to me about um, uh, about hip hop happening now in India and in the Middle East and throughout Asia and Africa, and uh, not just hip hop, but just like an organic, independent music community that's starting to develop, where there's kids that are really starting to own and create. Uh, their own, you know, create their own sound. Um, that wasn't the case, you know, 10 years ago when you, when you had those conversations. Now 
it sort of moved on and there's a really vibrant and interesting community out there. Mm -hmm. um, and now I think it's going to go really global. You know, I think that the future of music is going to be informed by ethnicity and local okay. language. And I think that Despacito was not an anomaly. It was just a, uh, a taster of what's to come from all around the world, whether that's BTS and South yep. Korea yep. or India or Arabic or, you know, Afrobeats, you know? Yep. Yep. Um, so it's a really exciting time. Now I feel like I'm like the old guy in the room watching all these guys sort of follow through on what we thought was possible, but is now only just starting to happen, you know? But you know what the cool thing is, Spec, is that, you know, with Divine and, especially with like someone like you who was, you know, there in the beginning and basically kind of helps be one of the foundation, one of the building block foundations for other artists that are now coming out, you know, who are of brown descent to become hip hop artists or, or whatever the genre they're getting into. I feel like you're not the old man. You are the, you are the lucky one who got to be an artist. And now he, now you got get to be an entrepreneur and now you get to, you basically get the best of both worlds, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, yeah, I feel the same way. I, 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 you know, transitioning from an artist to an entrepreneur was sort of a difficult one in the sense that I always felt like an imposter, you know, in my first few years doing business. When I first got offered my first job uh, in publishing, I was 30. So up until the age of 30, I had just been an artist 24-7, you know, and I didn't, you know, a relatively successful one, you know, I bought houses and, you know, I was touring around the world and I was doing well with it, signed publishing deals and record deals and the rest of it. Um, but, but, um, you know, it, it's, it, it, it's one of those things where when I got offered my first job, I wasn't sure if I, uh, I, I, you know, like you say, like my single, I'm a hippie. I, I never really meant that as a literal like statement. It was always to me an ironic statement sort of thing. Cause the, you know, the chorus sort of goes back and forth between, you know, I'm a hippie, but I got a tattoo, I'm a Rasta, but I got short hair. It was meant to be talking about contradictions, but it ended up sort of sounding like me just saying I'm a hippie, you know, uh, which is fine. I mean, I knew that that would be the case as well. Uh, but I always thought I was going to be a hippie artist. You know, yeah. I, 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 I didn't think I was going to ever have a nine to five job, uh, at all. Uh, not that this is nine to five, uh, but, uh, it's more like nine to three, you know, but, uh, <laughs> uh, AM, um, but, 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 but it, it, you know, I, I didn't think that that was a thing. And actually when I got offered it and I started first going into meetings, of course, I, started going into music companies, except now as an executive. And I knew a lot of these people because they knew me as, 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 a, as an artist trying to get a rec deal or publishing deal or whatever. So yeah. for that reason alone, I felt like an imposter, you know? Right. And then I, and then I realized over time that in the music industry, um, the people who actually know how to make music, you know, who have actually had the experience of touring and, getting jerked on contracts and having bad managers and good managers and going through the system yeah. uh, is quite an anomaly. You know, uh, not a lot of people have that experience, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and can actually relate to now an artist who's going through that and understand, you know, I mean, yeah. um, you know, I, at a seven, when you're a 17 year old kid and you're sort of famous in your home country, Right. Yeah. And you walk into a subway or you walk into a mall and kids are asking you for autographs. That's a weird experience. You know, yeah. it's sort of yes. you don't quite know what to make of it at the time. I mean, you dream of it. That's what you wanted and all of that. But when it actually happens and you're like going into a mall or you're trying to date a girl and she thinks she's believing all these weird things that some of her friends in college are telling these weird mythologies about me, you know, yeah. Um, then you're like, this is weird, you know? And, um, and so, um, so, you know, I, but I've been through that, you know, and right. I didn't go off the rails. Uh, yeah. um, so I think now when I talk to divine or I talk to any of the artists that I work with, you know, I, I come at it from a place where, you know, it's like, I can listen to a, a shitty demo and just be like, Oh my God, that chorus is amazing. You need to, 
you know, just build out the production a little bit more. And I have some authority when I say that because I actually know, I think I know what I'm talking about, you know? Right. So, um, so, you know, it's now in retrospect, my point is, is that um, I value uh, a lot. You know, I, I was scared of my, my first 30 years as an artist, you know, now I embrace it. Cause it's like, I know that I learned so many weird things that you can't read in a book, you know, right. Right. and, 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 and now I can try to help some of those other kids who are trying to do what I was doing, except I can right. help them more because actually there's somebody like me who knows, you know what I mean? Who, you know, in, in 97, I was recording demos where I was sampling Indian music and tablas and Bollywood records and putting hip hop beats behind it. This is like pre Timbaland and Missy Elliott. And at that time when I would play it, to, you know, I was still in the dream warriors and I was just shopping demos for my solo career. Yeah. And uh, I remember one a &R said to me, um, if you give me at the time uh, that, that black street song, no diggity was big. And he's like, give me no diggity with the sitar and I'll sign, you You know? And I felt it was such a shitty thing to say at the time. Right. Um, and you yeah. know, Spec, it's the equivalent of um, I have uh, black, uh, our, uh, you know, friends, actor friends, when they go and audition and they're like, yeah, can you make it a little bit more urban for me? Yeah, 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 exactly. Or, 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 or they tell me to put on an Indian accent or Pakistan. Can you make it a little bit more Indian? Can you make it a little yeah. more Pakistani? And you're just like, uh, do you want me to just rub curry all over my body at this point? What would you like? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, that was the thing, you know? And so now like, now I look at it like, yo, you know, like I, you know, if I'm talking to divine about, you know, a new song or whatever it is, it's like, I have some perspective uh, that is useful to him. I think, you know, rather than being a complete outsider who doesn't have some sort of, context for what they're trying to build culturally or what it means to them to embody their story in a authentic way, you know? So like I encourage, for example, you know, like one of the, I was in India um, a couple of years ago at a conference. And one of the questions from the audience at the end was, was an Indian girl, you know, and she, she sort of put it out to the audience and she was like, you know, I really want to like be successful. Um, do I have to sing in English? You know, and 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 there was a whole debate amongst the, you know the the, the panelists. Oh, you, you know, yes, it'll help if you go global, right? And I, I don't know. I think I flubbed my way through that that response, but but I thought about it a lot after, you know, and I still think about that question, you know, and I think it's bullshit to 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 want to run towards the paradigms that have existed and assume that that's what, you know, we don't have to water down what we do in order to gain global uh, recognition. You know, you don't need, um, that was the paradigm, you know, during the British invasion and the Beatles, you know, sure, you know, but in 2020, uh, my argument to a lot of these people is, uh, you know what, double down on who you are, you know, because that, that is, uh, completely unique. You know, Drake can't be like divine, you know, I mean, Drake can be the best Drake he can be, you know, but he can never do what divine does, you know, and, uh, and divine shouldn't try to do what Drake does. You know what I mean? Like, um, uh, I mean, we're all influenced by global hip hop or, you know, sort of, uh, R and B or whatever it is, but, but this idea of sort of wearing your identity on your sleeve is something that I think is super important. And I actually don't think it's a, I, I don't think it's a kink in your armor. I think, I, th I think it actually makes you stronger, you know? Right. Um, and, and, and I say that like to my Arab artists as well, like, yo, I don't want an English record necessarily, you know, let's do Arabic, let's do Arabic language because the world is, is becoming a global place That's and, uh, and it is a global place. And, you know, just the, the, the methods of dissemination have changed, right? Like it used to be a CD business. And when it was a CD business, um, uh, Africa and Asia was 90 plus percent piracy. 
So we never made any money out of Asia and Africa, right, as an industry, right? Um, with streaming, it's not being pirated. It's coming in through telcos and the rest of it. And so for the first time since streaming, since streaming has entered the fray, and it's only really entered the fray in Asia and Africa in the past, like, two years, really, you know? Wow. Um, and, and so it's super early days still, right? Uh, it took 10 years for Spotify to enter before it became, before it overtook the industry in the U S right. Um, so one could argue, could look at Asia and Africa and say, well, you know, we're in year two, you know, by, by about year seven, right. Um, you're going to have, uh, billions of people in Africa and India and Pakistan and, China uh, streaming and pe- and music rights holders and artists getting paid whatever a fraction of a penny on every stream but they're going to get paid on every stream right. you know they weren't getting paid like that they weren't getting paid on every sale you know they're That's more funny. in some case some markets it was 95 98 percent of piracy you know oh my goodness and, That's crazy. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's a complete paradigm shift. You know, the U S used to be the biggest market. It still is the biggest music market in the world, but that's not because it's the biggest market in the world. It's because it was the biggest big regulated market in the world. That's right. right. That's um, right. Uh, but there's still 320 million people there and 1. Uh, 1. 1.3 or so in, in, in India, you know, so if you get the same percentage of people streaming in India, then it's going to be a bigger, it's, it's absolutely going to be a bigger market, you know, and, and, and that's undeniable, you know, and so in the next six years, either India or China is going to overtake America as the biggest uh, music markets in the world. And when that happens, what do you think is going to happen to the way that we self define or self perceive what pop music is, right? If, a song is getting 2 billion streams in a month, right? And you're the head of some major record label in LA. You're trying to sign somebody in that market or you're trying to get Beyonce to do a duet with whoever's in that market because you want those streams. Sure. And so there's an inevitability of local language and um, sort of cultural identity becoming the new fabric of pop. It's not going to be about Britney. It's not going to be like super white Britney Spears and Christina Aguilera, you know, what? or Backstreet Boys. You know, that was an era and it made sense at that time. This is going to be a new era where, um, where, where, where pop culture is going to start to reflect uh, the economies of scale that are coming out of all of these other markets that have really been untapped for a long time, you know? And so it's a really interesting time and we're seeing it even in film, you know, like look how much uh, Asian content is cropping up on Netflix, you know, yeah. um, you know, uh, and, and Amazon and Disney and the rest of it, you know, um, so it's a really, really exciting time for, for this, you know, sort of for, for Asia and Africa opening up, which is exactly why I'm, I left New York after five years and I moved back to the Middle East to, to, to focus in on those opportunities. So Spike, I have a question. So a few questions. I mean, uh, this, this is so great. Um, now you're in Abu Dhabi or are you in Dubai? Uh, I live in Dubai, but my office is in Abu Dhabi. Your office is in Abu Dhabi. So now that you move back, I mean, you have your whole life there. You're, you know, you've got your wife and your kids and everything. How has music been? I mean, are, are, how are artists even able to, get together during the pandemic and even record together. I mean, the pandemic has just, you know, basically yeah. decimated a lot of, uh, I mean, look, my business is pretty much decimated right now. So. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, I don't know. It's hard to say, you know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, are they getting- I, I, can tell you with, I, I can tell you from a practical perspective, people, what we've seen with our writers the songwriter signed to us is they moved from doing sessions to doing zoom sessions, you know, and nowadays everybody's got a music studio in their house. It's super affordable. And so it's actually just as easy as making this call happen. You know, you can record a song that way. And I know, I mean, I recorded a, a, a song with Nitin Sani on his new album, uh, which is a, dropping very uh, soon. And, you know, I recorded the vocals over here. I sent it to him over there. He, produced it and mixed it came out as a single and um 
Are you talking about Pilgrim or Immigrant? Um, uh, it's, uh, so I was on Pilgrim, and then he and I recorded a song called Lifeline on his new album called Immigrants. Um, uh, uh, Lifeline dropped as a single about a month ago. Got it. Got it. You know, I remember watching uh, Gully Boy, which is a, you know, which is a mainstream Indian movie. Um, And I remember watching it and just being so blown away by it because I had listened to Divine before. uh, uh, And I was just because I'm also a big fan of Raja Kumari, who is an L.A. artist. And now she lives in India, uh, which is a very interesting choice on her part. But I guess that's where her fan base is. But Mm -hmm. uh, I remember watching Divine Story and watching Gully Boy. And just being so blown away by it, just being so moved by it. And, um, you know, so I look at somebody like, I look at somebody like Divine. I don't know what kind of artists are coming out of China. I'm sure they're speaking, you know, Mandarin or Cantonese or whatever they're singing in. Uh, you know, but I, the, the one success that has, like, really shocked the shit out of me is Blackpink and BTS, uh, the <laughs> Korean pop. I mean, K-pop yeah. is massive. I mean, they are massive. You know, I remember listening to them on the radio and I was just like, Nobody knows what the fuck they're saying. What are they saying? Like, I don't know. The beat is so good. I'm like listening to it, but I have no idea what they're saying. You know what I'm saying? Do you think yeah, that is the future? Is that the future of music where you're just like, I'm gonna bop to this beat, but I don't know what they're saying, but I'm gonna bop to it. I, I think it is, but I think that I think that you're gonna just start to see a lot of cross collaborations and. So maybe you'll know what they're saying in one verse, but you won't for another two verses, you know, and yeah. and it'll be a mix like that. I mean, if you think about it, you know, like uh, you see like, okay, Tacky Tacky uh, with Cardi B and, uh, yeah. you know, Azuna, Azuna and Selena. there's a bunch of pop artists on that one. Yeah. Uh, and it was a mix, you know, it was sort of Spanish, English, you know, and it, it sort of, it worked in so many markets because it was a mix. I mean, at the moment, Mirchi with, with, uh, which is dropping now, I got to shout out divine on that one. You know, that's one where, uh, it's divine and, uh, some of uh, the guys in his crew and it's with Stylo G who's a British Jamaican dance hall artist, you know? Um, and Stylo's really blown up at the moment in the dance hall, um, and the dance hall and reggae scene. Um, and, uh, you know, doing really well in that space, you know? So what does dance hall have to do with, you know, Indians doing rapping in Hindi, you know, how does that sort of work, you know? Um, but it does, it totally works, you know, and it sounds awesome, you know? Right. And, um, and so I think there's going to be a lot more of that sort of thing. Right. Right. You know, I always feel like people like uh, divine or even other artists, you know, I mean, hip hop, hip hop, came out of a out of a need to make a statement right the 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 ultimate like you know there's this great uh, documentary on netflix of uh called uh hip-hop evolution it's like literally one of my favorite docs i've ever seen yes. uh, it's freaking dope and um and you know you like, like you you watch the evolution of hip-hop and why you know the rappers were coming out and saying what they were saying i feel like divine is one of those rappers that makes a statement like like, hey, I come from the slums. Like, but this is the shit that's going down. I'm trying to keep it real. Um, are there other uh, rappers and other artists that are coming up in India, in Pakistan, you know, uh, that are in the hip hop world that are, are kind of making similar statements that are making it about, you know, what is happening in their world? Yeah, I mean, we 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 announced. Uh, so I, I sort of have a dual role where I'm. Uh, I'm, you know, I moved back uh, to to Middle East to sort of. I started my company Pop Arabia, and then in 2015, I got offered a job in New York at Reservoir, which is an independent uh, music publisher. Yeah. And uh, so I moved to New York in 2015, um, and then I moved back mm-hmm. last year uh, to focus on Asia and Africa. And right. um, uh, I'd say about two, three months ago, we announced that we had signed Divine to his his first, you know, sort of publishing deal, and that we had done a joint venture with Gully Gang, which is his entertainment company. Um, yeah. And as he signs and develops the next uh, wave of Indian rappers with with stories to tell, mm-hmm. 
you know, we are going to be signing those artists with him, you know, uh, through his company. So, uh, so we're excited about, you know, not just investing in Define, but being on the front lines of the next wave of hip hop groups. And it's not rocket science. I mean, you, you really just have to look at what happened in America. You know, this is, this is, this is 1992, you know, in America right now, you know, and, and, and we're creating the bad boys and the death rows right now, except for creating them in Africa, you know, Um, where's the box of brown and the little Kim's back? Where's the, (laughs) that's a good question. question. We're going to find them, you know, and, and, and that's the thing. It's like, it, it's, it, you, you really can just look at some of, look at the landscape and be like, oh, I really should find, you know, think about how we can find somebody that fills a similar gap that, you know, a similar space as some artists that you loved in the 90s, you know, and I think you, you'll see very similar patterns emerge, even though it's obviously um, contextualized to that market, you know. Um, so, you know, uh, MCL Toff, who's, uh, 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 who's featured on, on, um, uh, on the divine single Mirchi is, is probably next up, you know what I mean? Um, uh, in, in India through, through Gully Gang. Um, but they've got a whole crew of like really dope, dope, dope MCs, you know? Um, so we're looking at all of them. We're, we're looking to support them and build them up into the next generation of, of, uh, hip hop talent. Out Man, there. I yeah, I am a big fan of. Um, so I watch Black is King, of course, because I'm obsessed with everything Beyonce. Uh, and um, I've watched it twice actually. Uh, I can't believe I'm confessing this on air, but uh, I'm a huge fan. And um, one of the artists that, that uh, one of my dear dear friends in New York is uh, Nigerian, and um, and he was just like, oh my god, have you listened to Burna Boy? I was like, who is Burna Boy? I must listen to him. And uh, now all these like amazing artists are emerging from like Nigeria and just like you said, you know, from different, different African yeah. nations that you're just like, I didn't know this incredible artist existed. Like, why are they not, you know, I, I can't wait to hear from them. Is that something that you're also focusing on? Is that what Pop Arabia is also focusing on? Like signing up all this like new, amazing upcoming talent. I mean, Burna Boy is already there, but he's already probably signed with someone, right? Yeah, like so. So my my, uh, I'll give you an interesting statistic, right? So, uh, and this is a, another thing that is um, informed by uh, the advent of stream music streaming, right? Um, so, like in China, you're talking about China, right? Like, what do they listen to in China, right? So in China, the statistic um, that I overheard the 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 head of Tencent saying, right? Uh, Tencent owns five of the biggest streaming services in China, right? And uh, so it's a big multimedia organization. And um, so 95% um, of, so I'm sorry, 95% of the content available on Chinese, Chinese music streaming services is international, is non-Chinese content, right? Oh, wow. 95%, right? And 5% is Chinese content, right? But the 5% of Chinese content accounts for over 85% of the streams. Wow. Right? So if you're an enterprising entrepreneur, right, right. trying to figure out where the money is going to be in the next 10 years, I would recommend you go to China and sign a bunch of artists. That's right. Um, and Africa and India because um, the thing is, is that um, we know we've seen this movie before. We know how this is going. Streaming right. is going to continue to grow. Right. And this will continue to sort of be uh, a, you know, a, a big way of monetizing content. Um, and that being the reality, what we've learned from streaming services entering new markets is that it's, it sort of tends to be about local music and local language in every market you go to, you know, the old model was I took Beyonce or the Beatles and I front racked it in your record shop. And because I was a record company, I was the only one who who could actually physically distribute in all corners of the globe. 
You know, yeah. when I was in Dream Warriors, if I, if I didn't have a record deal, I couldn't get an album sold in a record shop in India because somebody had to own the global dis physical distribution network, right? Uh, with digital, that's completely abolished. And now you just go straight to the people, right? And when you give people um, the world's catalog at their fingertips at the end of a phone where they can choose whatever they want and they're not being uh, bombarded with, you know, usually the front rack stuff gets, you know, 80% of the footfall. And then that was the reason why, and, and the stuff that got front racked was the stuff being pushed by the big music companies, you know? And so as a result, you know, there was a, dis you know, even if you were in, you know, uh, you know, even if you were in Vietnam, you might be getting pushed Beatles and Beyonce and whatever it was right now, because everybody's sort of, it, it's, it's a completely democratized universe. Um, people tend to be going back into their old classics that they grew up on. And that tends to be local music and local language and the rest of it. And so, um, and so there's this sort of new uh, thing that's evolving where suddenly local music is much more important than it ever was, you know, right. um, right. Nitin always says, you know, when, when uh, in the nineties, when, Nitten would always get called world music, you know, and he hated it. You know, he won world music awards, you know, and he was just like, I hate that term. He's like, that's a ghetto term. You know, they're, they're trying to ghettoize me. You know, I'm not a world music artist, you know, I'm an artist, you know, and I'm influenced by flamenco and I'm influenced by hip hop and I'm influenced by African music and Indian music and, you know, guzzles and the rest of it. Right. But that's not, like this little category where you, you know, with a uh, hundred albums in the corner of the record store that nobody ever goes to, you know, sure. I, that, 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 you know, I'm a global artist. I'm not, you know, this, this idea of world music he felt was very um, belittling, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that term world music is so, I mean, at the time, to be honest with you, I didn't get his beef, you know, but I get it now, you know, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 um, and, you know, I think what we're going to see is like all pop music is going to be world music, you know, right. uh, the majority of it, you know, um, and, and, and that's a shift that's happening in pop culture as we speak, mm -hmm. you know, like you commented on my social network about uh, Amjad Sabri. Right. Oh, I was just going to talk about him. That's my childhood. You know, you know we, we represent a, a Pakistani company called Hira Media. And um, uh, about a year ago, uh, we were approached because Coldplay wanted to sample Amjad Sabri on, on their new album. You know, um, that, you know, that's kind of what I mean. You know what I mean? It's happening in every genre. It's happening. You know, why would they want to do that? You yeah. Know? Yeah. Um, and and why when they launched the album did they open it in uh, an open air concert on a rooftop in Jordan? Right. You know? Right. Um, you know, they're the type of band that can do that that's ostentatious stuff, you know, but 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 I think that the Coldplay sampling Amjad Sabri is uh, you know, a cousin of Stylo G and Divine doing a track together, which is a cousin of Tacky Tacky uh, or Desposito or Gangnam Style. You know, this is happening in every corner of the globe uh, and it's happening in small spurts. But as streaming becomes more ubiquitous in a lot of these parts of the world, uh, it's, it's, it's going to redefine the way that we look at pop culture. I mean, Spec, I'm actually very, very excited. I feel like, I feel, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, I have a very eclectic taste. I like to listen to Yugoslavian rap. Uh, I will uh, then go listen to Amjad Sabri. Uh, then I will go listen to, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't know, uh, freaking uh, A.R. Rahman. Um, my, like, my playlist is just all over the place, right? I don't yeah. care. If it's good music... I connect to it. I listen to it. I don't care. Um, yeah. And um, I feel that in the next 
15 years, globalization would be a almost a thing of the past where it would be the normal. Globalization would be a normal thing. Like if you are not with globalizing, you are a person of the past. 100%. Like 100%. you need to like get with the times, and because I'm also seeing that in stand up comedy, right? I'm gonna, I'm, I feel like I don't know if you know this, but all stand up comedians secretly want to be rock stars. Um, <laughs> we have like this very secret, we don't like to share it. Uh, but Dave Chappelle recently let it out, so I was like, okay, phew, if he said it, then I can also let that secret out. But for me, like music is a very, very big part of my life. Uh, the shows that I do, the shows that I put on, the music that I like to go up to on stage, those, they, they play, play a huge role uh, in my mindset as a stand-up and the kind of set I'm going to do. It, may, it plays a huge, huge role. Uh, but I feel like in stand-up comedy, we're still trying to bridge the gap uh, because there are certain cultural nuances that uh, you know you won't get, you won't understand unless you are you've been part of that, you know, culture or you're aware of that culture. So it's kind of hard to get that kind of nuance thing, but I don't feel music has that. Am I, am I correct? Like music doesn't have the music very easily kind of transcends. It just kind of crosses that border very, very easily. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I don't know. It's a cliche, but music is, you know, a really universal language. You know, you don't really need, you don't need language to understand it you know, to understand emotion. It's an emotional language, actually, you know, and so because it's an emotional language, it's a universal language. You know, you can feel completely um, captivated by something that you don't understand. I mean, I love the band Sigur C- Ross, you know, uh, yeah. which is an Icelandic band, you know, and when they sing, they don't sing in any language. They just sing melodies like, they, they they make up their own words basically, right? Yeah. Uh, that make that don't mean anything to anybody, but it's about them finding the right uh, emotional tone and melody for the whatever's the best vehicle for that song, you know. And what does it mean lyrically? I don't know, but it makes me want to cry, you know. And 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 nobody knows, you know. But but they've built an incredible career. Is just like, you know it's sort of like the most beautiful music that you, there's no way you can actually understand, you know, but they've built a massive following that way, you know? Um, so, so there's, you know, I think that, you know, I don't like, I can understand basic in the, these days, you know, but, but, uh, but I'm not fluent by any stretch of the imagination, but you oh, know, you know I've been to a lot of Indian music lately, you know, and I love it, you know, so I'm I don't think that, yeah. You know, whether you speak a language or not should yeah. uh, absolve you from, you know, right. connecting to it. I, I was actually going to say that the fact, since the fact you're, you're not fluent in Hindi, I was going to speak to you in Hindi for the next 15 minutes um, <laughs> and just watch your face. Just you're like, what is going on? What is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, you're just you're just slowly like turning the camera away from you. I want to catch the facial expressions. Uh, man, I wanna I wanna uh, I wanna ask you this, and uh, this is something uh, uh, you were kind enough to share this incredible uh, gay. Palestinian, I'm oh, sorry, can I say that? Okay, this Palestinian artist, uh, sorry, can I even say that? I don't want to say yeah, that. I'm in trouble. I don't um, think it's a secret. Okay, uh, because at the moment I saw, I was like, okay, first of all, let me just clarify why my gaydar has gotten good, okay? I live in West Hollywood in Los Angeles. Now, if you have ever been to West Hollywood in Los Angeles, it is the gayest part of Los Angeles, okay? I am, my gaybers, I see them all the time, uh, most of my friends are gay, male gay friends. I have lesbian friends. So my gaydar is pretty high. So when I watched the video of this person that you sent me, and I was like, oh, my God, how adorable is this? <laughs> he's so cute. Um, and he's adorable. My, what I wanted to ask you, when I watched him, you know, the thought that went through my mind was in America, in the West, um, I guess even in Dubai to a certain extent, you, you have the freedom to kind of express yourself uh, however you wish. But you know and I know there are certain areas in the Middle East, not certain, most predominantly most of Middle East and even in South Asia, you know, mm-hmm. 
when it comes to sexuality and kind of freely expressing yourself the way you want to, uh, even as an artist, whether it be music or however, it becomes restricted. It comes with the it comes with repercussions. So I mean, you're signing all these brilliant artists. They want to express themselves the way they want to. Have you thus far faced any backlash of any kind? And have, you know, or do you expect to face any kind of backlash? Uh, yeah, I'm not. To be honest with you, I'm, I'm I'm sure there's people who are not comfortable. You know, like we, you know, we at Reservoir have signed every type of artist you can think of. You know, yeah. we've signed, yeah. you know. Uh, uh, Young M.A. is signed to us. You know, she's, I think, the first, you know, massive, you know, openly gay rap, uh, lesbian rapper, you know. Um, and so, you know, I, I don't look at, you know. Well, in the West, it's fine. Really any of that stuff when I'm, yeah. like, trying to find an artist, you know. Yeah. Uh, I didn't sort of go looking for any, any any particular thing. To be honest with you, what happened was, I was invited to speak at a conference in Palestine uh, uh, over a year ago now, right? And um, I think it was last April, right? And so I'd never been to Palestine or Israel, so I was keen to check it out. Uh, I was curious. I knew that I was in the process of moving back soon to the Middle East, and so I thought this is a great opportunity to see some new Arab artists. We we want to sign, you know, some artists because of this, you know, sort of vision of where the music industry is going. So I go out to this gig and then somebody introduced me to his, uh, the artist's name is Bashar Murad. And so somebody introduced me to Bashar and uh, we just met, you know, and started talking, you know, there was no, uh, they, they mentioned that he was one of the artists that would be playing, but I hadn't heard his music. I, you know, I mean, he was, it was pretty cash, you know, we were sitting in my hotel room with a couple of friends and just chatting about Palestine and the music industry out here, out yeah. there. And, um, and, you know, I just said to him, Oh yeah, you know, when you're out there tonight, I'll, I'll come check you out, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, but you know, in my head, I was like, I didn't think I was going to sort of meet, you know, like a, a, a gay Palestinian artist, uh, yeah. That wasn't what I thought I was going to see when I come to Palestine to check out new music, you know? Mm. Um, and uh, and then I saw him play, you know? And he sort of came out. Uh, so so the crowd was about, we were in Ramallah. And it was about, I don't know, a few hundred locals, you know? And then a handful of the delegates from this conference. But it was by far the majority of the crowd was was just locals who came in to see a show. And he came out on stage and he had like a wedding veil on, you know, and uh, and then when the chorus hit, he sort of took the veil off and, you know, really went for it. Right. And it was a moment, you know, and I thought this guy's going to get like killed out here. <laughs> yeah. I had been to Palestine before. I had no idea. You know, all I knew was like what any of us see, you know, you watch TV yeah. and you, you have these, uh, even me, who's somebody who's lived out here and I sure. think is about as well educated on, you know, sort of this, the, the the region and the subject as anybody, I, I thought, uh, is this, you know, dangerous, you know? Sure. And they loved it, you know? They, they ate it up and he killed that show. He totally rocked that show, right? And it sort of, you know, I had a few people watching next to me who were like, whoa, I did not think this is what I was going to come see when I came down to Palestine, you know? And I certainly didn't think that that was the reaction that we'd get from a local crowd based on the sense that you sort of have this image of militancy or something like that in Palestine, you know? And the reality is very far from that uh, for the average person, you know? Yeah. Um, and so... Um, so yeah, it was really interesting. I, I was sort of like, this guy's really interesting. Um, you know, so we stayed in touch, you know, and he started sending me demos of things that he was working on. And then um, the song that you heard uh, was a demo and I really liked it. And uh, I said, you know, I think this is really good, but I think, 
you know, we should get a producer, you know, get a producer involved, you know, and, and um, we have a producer uh, signed to Reservoir who named Gannon Arnold, who's a writer producer, and he's done uh, all kinds of pop stuff, now United and Demi Lovato and all kinds of stuff like that. And uh, he loved the song and, and Bashar, and they started working long distance. So going back to what you're saying, you know, I mean, Bashar was in Palestine, Gannon was in LA, and they started working back and forth over the past year on that, wow. you know. Wow. And that song was produced uh, just recently, you know. And then we got Marcella Areca, who mixes all of the Timbaland stuff, you know, who's another one of our writers. She mixed it, so it sound, it's it's got that bump, you know. Yeah. Um, and it sounds like, a, I think, a global record, you know. Yeah. Um, and even, you know, I describe it as it sounds like a Holiday Inn song. Like, it sounds like a song you hear by a pool, you know, at a resort in the Caribbean, except it just happens to be in Arabic, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I thought that that was super interesting, you know. Like, I'd never heard anything like that, you know. But it felt to me like it encompassed this whole new world that we're going into, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so, you know, we signed him, we, we got him working, uh, with Gannon. We have an EP that's queuing up to, to come out, uh, very soon. And that single and video we've just shot and we're dropping that in the next few weeks. So, um, so yeah, very exciting. Not at all what I thought, but you know, not at all what I thought I was going to see when I got to Palestine. I didn't think I was going to come to Palestine and necessarily sign somebody, um, uh, off the back of that one trip, but but you know, I met uh, somebody that 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 you know we really clicked, you know, and you know he's a really interesting artist because um, you know the way I see it is you know th there is a lot of misunderstanding and misconception of what is uh, what is going on in um, in Palestine and and or even what. Palestinian people are, or you know what I mean? Like it, I had an incredible time in Palestine. I, you know, I, I'd say, uh, I'd say at least half of the people I was with were Europeans and Americans. And many of them were Jewish who had been to Israel, but had never been to Palestine. Wow. And all of us, you know, a hundred percent of the, 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 the people that were there were all like, like, wow, this is not what I thought it was going to be, you know? Yeah. Um, and uh, so it was a real eye opening experience. And I, what, what I felt coming away from that was Bashar is like a, a great messenger for, for his cause. You know, he's, yeah. he's talking about some real shit, you know, yeah. he's talking about the realities of living on the ground, you know, uh, as a Palestinian, yeah. Um, you know, just from his, you know, his observations of, of, yeah. of his frustrations and, 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 and what his life is like. And, uh, and I think the fact that he's able to do it in a way that really reflects who he is as a person and is not sort of stereotypical in any way, right. uh, it makes him a great messenger for, for his cause, you know. What is Bashar's last name? It's Murad, M-U-R-A-D. So you'll find some videos, you'll see some music, uh, you know, on 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 the, the streaming platforms, and on you'll see some of his videos on YouTube. Um, but uh, the next single, Mascara, it's called, uh, is coming out in a few weeks. It's not out yet, but uh, uh, yeah, you'll have to look out for it. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm. I'm very, very excited. I mean, the, the video, uh, you know, which I kind of had the preview to. Um, it uh, was it. Sh where is it shot? Is it shot in Ramallah? Where is it shot? It's actually it's, it's shot in uh, in in Bethlehem. Uh, so Banksy has a hotel in Bethlehem called the Walled Off Hotel, uh, and it's <laughs> it's sort of. It's, it's, yeah, like, so it's, it's a really, I mean, I've been there and it's, it's a really mad place. It's, it's sort of like a museum uh, of the occupation, you know, and it's right in front of, you know, what Palestinians call the apartheid wall, you know, it's just this wow. massive wall that's, you know, separates them from uh, the other side. 
And, uh, and, and so over the years it's been graffitied up and there's, you know, graffiti of Trump and, you know, all kinds of slogans and really interesting Banksy style art all over it. Uh, and so they built this sort of hotel right in front of the wall. And when you, when you get, when you get a t-shirt from the hotel that says, you know, the hotel with the worst view in the world, you know, uh, cause it's just, it's literally just facing the wall. There's nothing else that you see, you know? Um, and so, uh, so yeah, we, that, that was the first time a, a music video was being shot in, in Banksy's hotel. So, uh, wow. so that was a cool thing to do. That is, that is so, Spike, I, I am just so excited listening to you about all these amazing artists and what they're doing and the kind of statements they're making. Um, I always believe that, um, art in any form, music, comedy, filmmaking, you know, it really kind of a lot of times this makes stops and makes people think about the things that they're doing and the actions that they're taking. And, you know, I feel like in Bashar's case, he is talking about really the embracing of the LGBTQ community that is often silenced, you know, in Muslim communities and Muslim countries, period, not just Palestine, just across the board. Um, yeah. and, and what a what a brave uh, and a you know, innovative and groundbreaking artist, and uh, so incredibly courageous. You know, to stand up and to. Uh, I mean, is he is he out in like? Does everybody in his family and does he, is he out? Is he like yes, I'm openly gay, or is that not a thing that's talked about? Um, no, it's, it's talked about. I mean, if you if you you know Google him, you'll see that there's been articles in the BBC and the Guardian and uh, the Globe and Mail. You know, d- different. Uh, newspapers and uh, you know trades and stuff have written about him as you know because I think people were surprised that somebody like him existed you know um, and uh, so it, it's been written about you know my thing is that I, I think it's you know uh, it's obvious you know who he is um, is obviously a big part of the story, but at the end of the day, he's, I think an incredible artist, you know, like he's, he, you know, he directed that video. He's directed all his videos. Oh my God. Uh, he wrote hundred percent of that song, you know, um, which is not necessarily common these days. Uh, most songs are written by three or four uh, people these days. I mean, if you look at the pop charts, five or six people, you know, uh, so somebody who wrote, wrote 100% of the song, uh, music, lyrics, melody, you know, you name it, and they shot the video and stylized it and did everything. And he, he's, you know, uh, you don't come across that every day, you know. Um, and so for me, it's like, well, you know, he, he's an artist. He's meant to express himself however uh, – you know, however he can authentically based on his worldview. And that's where his value is, but he's an incredible artist, you know, at the bottom, at the end of the day. And that to me is, is sort of like the most important thing. And now our, our job is just to support him in being able to tell his story. Uh, and hopefully, you know, for me as an A&R or as a, as the head of the label is to try and sort of give him, the tools that he needs to make the best music that he can, you know, or create the best art that he can, you know, uh, and hopefully it'll find an audience. Expected. I mean, I mean, it's wonderful. I think what you're doing and what your label is doing uh, is absolutely outstanding. Um, I mean, the last time I was in Dubai headlining a show was about three years ago. So I'm definitely overdue. Uh, uh, let well, me tell come, you. If you come down, you got to come, come check me, you know, oh, yeah, definitely. I no, I'm totally going to stalk you, Spec, so just get ready. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, like, totally stalk you. I've never been to Abu Dhabi, actually. I've been to Dubai a few times, but I've never been to yeah. Abu Dhabi. So I definitely, I'm definitely going to be there. Um, so, Spec, where where can people kind of follow these incredible artists and their music? Like, where can they go check all this stuff out? I know I put up your website here, paparabia.com. Is there anywhere else that people can follow you, people can follow Pop Arabia? Yeah, we've got the artists that, that you know, we, we're we're literally just start, you know, the, the signing regional artists is a fairly new uh, sort of, uh, you know, aspect of Pop Arabia's business. So historically, we were representing music publishers in the Middle East and licensing their music. We're now signing and developing regional talent with our partners at Reservoir. 
Uh, so on the Poparabia website, you'll see Bashar's name and links to his social media and the rest of it. And then you'll see uh, another artist named Chris, who's a Lebanese, uh, uh, Lebanese uh, soul singer, really. Um, and uh, yeah, th- their, their links and, and what they have uh, is, 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 you know, you, you can get the links to their, their social media and the rest of it on uh, Poparabia.com. But this was really fantastic. Uh, thank you for waking up at 7 a.m. to do this. <laughs> no worries. Only for you, Mona. You're the best, Beck. You're the best. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, I, I thought I, I learned so much today about just about the music, just about what's happening and what you guys are doing in the Middle East. I mean, it's uh, it really is outstanding what you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Absolutely. You keep on doing what you're doing. You're part of the. You know, part part of you're you're opening it up on the other end as well, which is awesome. You know. Yeah, trying to trying to trying to start a revolution, Spec. Yeah, one you step know. at a time. One step at a time, man. Spec, thank you so much for tuning in. I will definitely talk to you soon. But uh, really great conversations. So thank you. You too. Thank Bye-bye. you. Bye. That was the lovely and amazing Hussein Spec Yusuf. You guys, I had a fantastic conversation. I hope you, hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, I definitely did. Uh, I will be back tomorrow with a also a DJ in uh, uh, Dubai, one of the biggest DJs in Dubai, DJ Bliss. Marwan is his real name, but he goes by DJ Bliss. Uh, and uh, I had a fantastic time working with him about three years ago because he is the one who uh, asked me to come out to Dubai and headline a show. So I'm finally getting an opportunity to bring him on and have a conversation. But you guys, thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't uh, followed me on YouTube yet, please do. You can. Uh, my link is below, Mona Shea Comedian. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Mona's Comedy. Thank you, so, thank you so much for tuning in late. I appreciate you. I will see you tomorrow, 6.15 Pacific. Have a good night.